Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And with us tonight, the new housing minister appointed this week, passionate Brexiteer Dominic Raab, Labour's Shadow Secretary for Women and Equalities, Dawn Butler, the businesswoman who took the government to the Supreme Court to get Parliament to vote on Article 50, and one, Gina Miller, stand-up comic, radio presenter and writer, Nish Kumar, and scourge of so-called political correctness, friend of Donald Trump, journalist and broadcaster, Piers Morgan. So, well, just before we take the first question, you can, of course, as always, argue from home about the issues that are raised here. Uh, no longer, I'm told, on text, but hashtag BBCQT on Twitter, Facebook and on Instagram. Our first question is from Kerry Buckingham, please. When are ridiculous suggestions of a second EU vote going to stop? Let's give the voters who spoke the first time what they voted for and let's just hurry up and leave. Well, this is, I think, must be in the light of what Nigel Farage said today about how he was coming around to the idea, that's what you're on about, that there might be a second referendum. Um, Gina Miller, you've got uh, Nigel Farage going for a second referendum. You in favour? I don't think it's a second referendum. It's a vote on the deal, whatever that is. But um, I want to say that this, none of this is helpful to anybody. This whole leave, remain, you're right, we're wrong. We've actually got six months from April to October for this government to show some competence, to go out there and get the best possible deal they can, and then at that point, I think the people should have a say on whatever that deal and the other options are. Because I've invested a lot of, I invested a lot of time, energy, my safety to give Parliament a voice, and it was a weak, dishonest one in my view. And so I don't trust Parliament anymore. I think it's got to be the people's vote and a people's vote on the options at the end of September, October this year. A people's vote, not a parliament vote. Yes. No. OK. Uh, so, Dominic Raab, what do you make of Farage saying maybe I'm reaching the point of thinking we should have a second referendum? You beginning to think that too? No, I think it's interesting, though, that on the two fringes, whether it's the Lib Dems who are in favour of a second referendum or the UKIP, uh, neither of those were originally... I mean, Vince Cable, now the leader of the Lib Dems, in 2016 at their conference said he thought it was wrong in principle, counterproductive in practice. Nigel Farage wasn't in favour of an original referendum. He said that vote for UKIP will just take you straight out. Um, so I don't think what they're doing is as a matter of democratic principle, it's raw political expedience. Now, from my point of view, not only is it wrong in principle, we've had the vote, mm. let's get mm. on and deliver a successful mm. Brexit, but mm. actually, if we did have a second referendum, the message we would send to the EU at this crucial time in the negotiations is that if you offer us the worst terms, actually, we may come crawling back. I think what we should do right now is show some economic, um, uh, some, some political ambition, we should have some economic self-confidence, we should go into 2018 proving the doubters wrong. We need to get the best deal for the whole of this well, country. Why is your government doing whether that? You vote it, well, you keep... You, yeah, they're you not can, negotiating so, anything. So Gina, you've been... Incompetence has been extraordinary. Really? Well, you said that we wouldn't even get... <laughs> OK. You said... You said Parliament should have its say. We yes. passed the Article 50 legislation. Absolutely. We've passed through the Commons stage the EU withdrawal bill. We won 42 out of 43 votes. Now you're shifting the goalposts yet again. You said we haven't made any negotiation I progress. I haven't shifted any uh, Hold on, hold on. We got the first phase agreement. We dealt with that crucial issue of EU nationals, UK expats. We've moved on to trade talks. Stop shifting the democratic goalposts. Yeah. There Let's are give no a fair Hang on a second. The no, let me just ask you a question. Oh, you, no you say you're against a second ref referendum. If it had gone the other way, you said... No, it didn't. You, you... Well, let me finish. He's frightened of the will you, of the people. He knows you what's said, coming. I know what's coming. Well, yeah. I, all right, well, I'll read you what's coming. If the verdict is to stay in the EU, you said, and it's close, I think those that don't want to revisit it should pause for a few years and then, at 2020, have a second vote. No, what, what, what I said, that's wrong. 
Well, it's from the House magazine, the yeah. 9th of June, no, I'll 2016. I'll tell you exactly did you, what I did, said. Did you sue the House I, magazine? No, you, no, I didn't. What? I didn't, but I did correct it at the time, and I'll correct you as well, David. What I said was when asked whether this would put to bed the EU issue forever, I said you'll never put down that issue forever, not least because in legislation there's an EU lock which would enable us to have a second referendum, and it would obviously come up in a future leadership contest. But what I did say is actually we should hold the EU to its word and give them a chance to deliver the deal and then we should judge it according to whether it's delivered on, on the deal. And I, and I very clearly said... Revisit? Um, did you use the word revisit? I was asked whether we Did would... Did you use the word revisit? I was asked whether under any <laughs> circumstances we would revisit and I said of course you're not going to stop people debating the EU. So why shouldn't clear. she revisit in that case? Well, she can, and she can make the case for it. But let's leave the EU first, make, uh, finish these negotiations, get okay. the best deal for the I country. I think Dominic and is then... frightened of the will of the people on that vote. Well, all right. <laughs> yeah, OK, let's, uh, I'll come back to you. Go on back there. Um, I mean, it was painful, the first phase of the negotiations, absolutely painful. The Prime Minister struggled uh, to get an agreement. And the thing is this, we have to look at jobs, trade and investment and all of those things have to be considered before we could even leave the EU. So do I agree on a second referendum? I think that's Nigel Farage looking for attention <laughs> and I don't think we should give him any more attention than he already gets because I think he gets enough. I think that the government has fought every single step of the way when we say that we want to have a meaningful vote in Parliament. We put forward uh, an opposition day debate and Parliament made it clear that we wanted to have a meaningful vote on the You've deal. Already been and that then door. we had to have another vote that the government was trying to uh, derail and then we beat the government. We beat the government on Come that. On, and so now that we will have a meaningful vote on the deal and I think that's important. What do you make of 78% of Labour voters saying there should be a referendum on the deal. But there's, there's a, a mixture of views all around, which is 78 fine. 78% of Every, Labour voters? But that's fine. Your own, your own constituency are fine. all pro Everybody Remain can have a view. I mean, I voted uh, to remain. I was really disappointed with the results. Uh -huh. But the end results are the results. We have to wait while we go through this painful process of the second phase, and then we'll see what the end deal is, and then we have a vote in okay. Parliament. I come to members of the honest moment. Nish Kumar. Um, well, I mean, first of all, of course, Nigel Farage wants a second referendum because at the moment I literally don't know how he's filling his days. <laughs> like, <laughs> between sort of campaigning for alleged sex predators in Alabama and accepting far right <laughs> invitations in Germany, I really don't know. I mean, he maybe just needs to take up a hobby. But my concern is when we talk about the best possible deal and we talk about the fact that the country has spoken, I don't really understand what either of those two things looks like because what we said in the referendum was that we wanted to leave. But did that mean remain part of the single market? If so, if we're leaving the single market, how does that translate in Ireland? How does that work with the hard and soft border? There's a lot of questions that need to be answered, and it's a much more complicated question than we were originally asked. So I don't really see the problem with having been asked the first time. Why can't we be asked a second time once we actually know what we're being asked to do? OK. <laughs> Man of the floor, sir, yes. If we actually... If we actually go back to the vote in 2016, we were told exactly what we were being asked to do. A leaflet was sent out by the British government to every household in the country that said, this is your decision, the government will implement what you decide, and it was clearly stated that leaving the European Union meant leaving the single market. David Cameron said that, George Osborne said that, the whole Remain campaign said that. So, it's about time that, pe that the Remainers at the moment stop with these delaying tactics, Stopped asking for more and more votes until you get the result you wanted and just accepted the biggest political turnout in British voter history, accepted the result and got on with what the people okay. said. But I, I'm really sorry. I, I'm just, I have to ask again. I hate to keep bringing it back to this one incredibly important issue. How does that translate with the soft or hard border between Northern and Southern Ireland? How does us leaving the single market work when Ireland is an EU member state that is part of the single market and shares a border? Is this a sort of covert ploy by Leave voters to reunite Ireland? Because if it is, that is a real surprise to okay. everyone. Well, I'm, I'm All right. actually part Irish and I support United Ireland, so I'd be quite happy with that. But that was, oh, yeah, I'm pretty the... sure that wasn't the point of the, uh, <laughs> the, the referendum woman, or the Conservative the Party. The woman in the third row from the back there. 
I just want to go back to the current government and, Dominic, your statement. How do you expect us to trust your party when just then a quote that came out of your mouth you were not held accountable for? Well, no, but that's the point. A quote. That was it was a, a quote no, that no, came out if... of your mouth and then there was Sorry, still a Sorry, can I answer your question? Because yeah, you I, I want to. That was taken in the referendum. There was a selective quote taken by the House magazine. I was asked about it at the time and I came straight out and said, all I'm saying is that you can't say permanently debate will be locked down forever, but what we need to do is implement the referendum and... Um, um, that means leaving the EU. If people wanted to make the argument that's been made for a second referendum, when we had the original legislation back in uh, 2015 and, uh, and decided on it, that argument should have been made then. No one argued then we should have a referendum on the outcome of the deal. It is just shifting the democratic goalposts, and that's not okay. on. OK, Piers Morgan. Well, look, we're in Islington here, which is the heart of Arsenal uh, Football <laughs> Club. <laughs> My team. And we recently got dumped out of the FA Cup in the third round for the first time uh, in over 20 years. And I, I would like to play that game again. Uh, I don't like the result. I would like us to have won. And I would like to have a rematch That's next true. Sunday. Yeah, I'd like to just have a rematch because uh, but I Piers, think... But Piers, in 2014, no, you said in, a, in an interview with Giselle... Yeah. Stuart, that it was too complicated and that not even you, none of us Let knew me, what it was I, all about. Everyone's had their say. If I could just finish my point. Can we leave the Arsenal well, analogy well, now yeah. for well, the, analogy, the rest of the country who may the not be so involved The analogy is bleedingly in obvious, which is this, which is you don't get to replay a football match when you get the result you don't like and you don't get to replay a referendum <laughs> when you don't get the result you like. Now, I, I speak as somebody who voted Remain. I wasn't entirely sure, and I'll tell you why. When I was editor of the Daily Mirror for 10 years, at the start of the 2000s, we had a big question mark about whether to enter the euro, a single currency. And I had Tony Blair and Gordon Brown and Peter Mandelson, Alistair Campbell, a lot of business people you're now seeing popping up telling us about the horrors of leaving Europe, all telling me if we did not enter the single currency, the euro, this country was dead, financially dead. Well, guess what? Guess what? We but Gordon did. Brown stopped that. Well, let me, let me, let me finish. <laughs> just say. They did hashtag it. just oh, no, say. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> hashtag just say. I, I was there at the time talking to them on a daily basis. I know what they were all saying at the time. I know how it then played out. The point is we didn't enter the euro, and actually it was the best thing that we ever did, was to not enter the euro. So I take a lot of what these experts say with a pinch of salt. But on the point of the question, no, we can't have another referendum. It doesn't matter who is asking for it, whether it's Gina, whether it's Nigel I'm Farage. I'm asking for reference. The people, the people have had their say. And, and, the, and the man made a very good point there, uh, the gentleman there, about what we were told this was, vote, vote was about. June the 12th, 2016, David Cameron on Andrew Marr's programme on the BBC, what the British public will be voting for is to leave the EU and leave the single market. No ambiguity. So this idea that they we're all too said, stupid they also and nobody be, knew... But they also said there'll be £350 million pounds a week for the NHS. What happened to that? Well, OK, all right, leave I agree. Let me go to the woman over there. We're just bring more members of the audience in. The woman on the very left there. Yes, you. Yes, yes, it's um, over your head. Dominic Raab and, and many others keep talking about the best deal for uh, Britain and that we will now proceed to get the best deal. If you're so confident that this is going to be the best deal, why not put it to another referendum? Well, because I think fundamentally, if we told the EU now that if they offered us the worst deal, we might come back in, that would virtually guarantee, as a matter of common sense diplomacy, that they would. So I think that would totally undermine our negotiating position. But when I talk about the best deal, I want to give effect to the referendum, take back control of our money, our laws and our borders. But I also want to continue the good things about the EU, the cooperation on trade, on security and all sorts of other areas. My father was Czech. We're leaving the EU. I'll feel no less European on my side of the family after that. I just want to get away from the undemocratic club, take back control over our own laws. OK. And that's what we're going to do. Man up there. Awesome. The problem with the referendum is it's too simple a question and too complex an issue. And how we leave Europe is absolutely crucial. I run my own small business. If we leave Europe with a no trade deal, it will be disastrous for my business and the people I employ. So it's absolutely crucial. I don't have a problem with the second 
a, a re referendum. I mean, Parliament weren't even going to get a vote on it at one stage. But there's another way of dealing with this. The Labour Party are a shambles on Europe. Why don't you have the guts to make the general election a referendum on Europe and clarify your stance versus what the Conservatives come back with in a, in, in a, in a deal from leaving Europe? Why don't you have the guts to clarify your stance and make the next general election about Europe and play it out in a full general election campaign where everybody can be informed informed about the true issues behind whether right, we stay well, we'll, or leave we'll put Europe. it to dawn, but what would you have the um, Labour Party campaign saying? Well, I, I would have the Labour Party with 78% of their supporters uh, wanting to stay within Europe. Why don't you come off the fence, believe we should at least stay within the single market and make that the issue you campaign right. in the general dawn. election? So, you raised a couple of issues there uh, in regards to your business, and I think that's the reality of the situation, and that's what has to be considered in regards to negotiating the deal. I mean, I, mean, I hope that there's a general election this year, and if there is a general election this year, uh, then, you know, you'll be clear of, on our manifesto. But we've talked, the, the Labour Party's been very clear in regards to the single market and the customs union. You haven't been have, remotely have, clear about have, any of it. What are you have, talking about? We have been clear. But what, what is the position of the party? On the single market, what we're saying is that we're looking at goods, uh, services, um, and immigration on the single market. Do we stay in or but leave? It, it has to be negotiated. Simple question. And that's, do we stay in the single market or do we but leave? Piers, it? You've already, you've already, well, it's a no, simple question. Yeah, but you're talking, as you say, it's a simple question, but it's a complex situation. What's the answer? As the gentleman said, what's I'm the answer? Well, do you want me to speak, Piers? Or do you want to keep it's attacking? Yes, it's Piers, a yes or no Piers, to these fundamental questions. Well, if, Piers, do you want me to respond or do you just want to keep it? Because if it's I'd your like show... You to answer the question. If it's your show, carry on. I honestly have no idea what Labour's position All right, you is. Made, well, you've made the point. You're, uh, not, Dawn, you're not allowing me to speak. No, well, he will, he, no, he will now allow you to speak. You speak and then so, we'll go to this gentleman here. So, on the customs union, we're saying that at the end of the day, we can be in something that will look very similar to the customs union. That is what Labour's party's position is. But it's all about negotiation. On the single market, we want to negotiate uh, access to the single market. The best deal for businesses, the best deal for people, the best deal for jobs. We need to have that negotiated. That's Labour's position. So all right, stay no, 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 wait, Piers. You, you can't just stay in. All right, no, stop, stop, in stop, stop, stop. You. I think we'd have to ask ourselves, though, if we went back into Europe, what Europe we were returning to. I mean, they've made it clear that they want to have a, a, um, a uh, European army and things that everyone, when we were in the, in the EU, we voted against. And this is what we were returning to. We'd be fighting the same old battles over and again. And no matter how much we fight them, the ideas will still come back. Just because they stop now doesn't mean the ideas will be reborn again in the future. OK. And you in the, in the front row here. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, just to go into what um, Dominic Raab said earlier, um, he said that they spent... Um, got, had a really successful year where they sorted out um, the rights of EU nationals living inside the UK and um, the rights of uh, EU nationals living here and British nationals living abroad. But that's a pretty simple issue. That is something that can be sorted out within a couple of weeks. You say that the rights of the EU nationals here will be protected and the rights of British nationals abroad will be protected. Um, and then you set a good tone for negotiations and you can move on. But it took the government a year to sort that out. And I think Gina made a very valid point by saying, how can we trust the government to deliver a good deal if it took them so long to uh, deliver on something All that right. is rather simple? Briefly, to answer that point. It, it didn't take a full year. We started the negotiations in April and we got to that position in December. But it was a much thornier technical issue because it wasn't just the status. It was things like health insurance. It was things like pensions. It was tricky. And the reason it took so long, we'd like, we said, the government said, even before we start the formal negotiations, let's resolve this issue because real people's lives are at stake. The EU took a rather dogmatic line and said, no, we're not going to do that. But look, in any event, the fact is a lot of people were saying we wouldn't get to that first phase deal. We did. I think there's a much stronger spirit of cooperation. Let's look for the win-win deal. It's not a uh, zero-sum game, or a deal that works for Britain, that works for the EU. And actually, you know, I mean, Dawn's just articulated a position that is actually rather similar to the government's position, which is we want to get the best out of the relationship on trade, on security. But this is what we said but, from the very beginning. But, but we said we needed so, a Dawn, transitional I, deal. I didn't interrupt Labour you. said we wanted I a transitional deal from the very beginning. The Tories were saying there will be no transitional so, deal. Now you're saying I didn't, there will I be I didn't interrupt you, Dawn, but the answer to the 
question that Piers and others asked is, of course we have to leave the customs union, of course we have to leave the single market. Jeremy Corbyn told the uh, Labour MPs on Monday night that that was the position, whereas Keir Starmer has said we should leave the position open. So it is a total shambles. We're in government, we've got to lead, there is no real choice here. You can't stay in the single market and leave the EU, but there is all sorts of other ways through trade deals, through security cooperation, that we can have a okay. strong relationship Fine. going forward. Um, before we take another question, Hereford is where we're going to be next Thursday, and Dumfries the uh, week after that. On the screen are the details of how to apply, and I'll give them in full at the end. Uh, take a question from Josh Anthony, please. Josh Anthony. With the resignation of Toby Young, are we giving into mob rule by a snowflake generation? Uh, yes, uh, Toby Young's resignation after a very brief, a day or two only, I think, in post. Uh, Piers Morgan. Uh, look, he said some distasteful things. No one's questioning that. They were things he said in the past. And Dawn and Angela Rayner, amongst others on the Labour side, led a charge to get him sacked. And he eventually quit before I suspect he was about to be sacked. So they got their scalp. So Toby Young is off this little quango that no one had really heard about anyway. No one really heard about Toby Young before this week, probably. And he's now gone. What it raises to me is the question of hypocrisy and double standards and consistency. Because there's a Labour MP called Jared O'Mara, who is still a Labour MP. He hasn't been sacked. Uh, he posted far worse stuff. He's suspended, I think. He's suspended, but he's not sacked. Uh, he posted far worse stuff. And when it all came out, and a lot of the stuff was presented to the world, Angela Rayner... Who, let me finish, let me Jared's finish. Jared's posted worse stuff than Toby Young? Yes, absolutely. Are you kidding you'll get me? A you'll get a chance to respond in a moment. I'm going to finish my point. You can go and see what Jared O'Mara posted. You can make your own minds up. But everyone who's seen them will know what I'm talking about. Angela Rayner, who led the charge against Toby Young, she stood and, uh, up and next to him and said, I stand by this guy. This is, this is in the past. He said sorry. We need to move on. So he's still a Labour MP. So he is not apparently as bad as Toby Young. Then we come to John McDonnell, the number two in the Labour Party. He said in 2010 he wanted, he's on any questions, he wanted to assassinate Margaret Thatcher. He then repeated this story gleefully at a Labour meeting with the same Angela Rayner sitting next to him, who was laughing and nodding as he recounted this story. Second story involving uh, John McDonald. Okay, McDonald's. I think that's well, enough. No, 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 no that's is, enough, thank no, you. No, Piers, you've made two okay. points. Dawn Butler, I'll come back to you if okay. necessary. Can I, make, can I, finish, the, can I finish my point? In a sentence, please. Okay, the finish the point is this. He then also repeated a story about Esther McVeigh, who, uh, who someone has said should be lynched. My point is this. What is actually worse? What Toby Young may have said a few years ago in clumsy, stupid and offensive posts on Twitter. 45,000 tweets he you'll get a, You'll get a chance to respond. No, Piers, Piers, Piers. You'll get a chance. All right, Piers, I don't want... Piers, yeah. I do not want... I do not want a monologue. No, 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 wait, stories. Dawn. My point is simple. The, you're missing point. the question yeah. is, are we giving in to mob rule my by a snowflake generation? My point is... Yes or no? My point is, I think we are, and the mob rule does not apply the same standards All right. to people on the Labour side that it applies to someone like Toby Young, who coincidentally happens to be a Tory. OK, Dawn Butler. I mean, this, is, this is typical. The guy's deleted 45,000 tweets. I don't know how many people are prolific tweeters in the audience. I don't know if you've done 40... To have to delete 45,000... It's a day's work 45, for me. Piers, can you keep quiet 45, while she speaks, please? Tweets. Thank you. <laughs> she asked a question. Four, 40, you've deleted Not of you, you're not in the audience. <laughs> she asked the audience, not you. Right, go on, Dawn. So, Come on, let's stop this nonsense. So, the issue is... Not that, nonsense. I Sorry. swear he thinks this is his show. I mean... Well, it might be one, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I do, there you go. There you go. I doubt it. I doubt it. I don't think you're that skillful at your job. But anyway, 45,000... Tweets Toby Young deleted. And the thing is this the reason why nobody has heard of this new uh, government body was because it starts on April the eighth it starts on April this year. So it actually hasn't actually been started. The announcement of Toby Young was announced at one minute past midnight. One minute past midnight. So they're trying to sneak this announcement out. 
Now, there's, a, there's an issue with suitability. There's an issue with process. Was full process carried out when he was elected, when he was appointed to this position? Was he suitable for this position? And did, or did he get this position on merit or because of privilege and being mates with certain people? Those are the three main issues that have to be addressed. I am not in favour of appointing somebody who talks about dressing up as a woman and going to gay clubs and molesting lesbians and writing about it. That's unacceptable. Or, or, or laughing about anal rape of women. Or talking about eugenics and weeding out disabled people. Or complaining that schools have ramps so disabled people can get an education. That is not suitable criteria for somebody be, to be appointed to a government body. OK. Running up there. Um, I'd just like to point out that a lot of the stuff that Toby Young said was directed towards women. And um, I don't understand why, as a society, or why like certain establishments within society continuously give a platform to men who are disrespectful and downright awful about women. With the Jared O'Mara situation, he was suspended. So that... He's not been sacked. Um, that's not my point. I haven't heard Dawn okay, call well, for him to be can sacked. Can I just finish? Because my point is actually that Toby Young resigned, so then took that agency to resign himself. Jared O'Mara was suspended by, the, by somebody else, so he still wasn't given the privilege or the opportunity to resign. Still can. All right, the woman there on the gangway. I'm a student. And frankly, what Toby Young says is just disgusting. He talks about social mobility and he talks about how you can encourage people from lower incomes by giving them, you know, eugenic treatment and allowing them to rise up and improve their intelligence. How can a man like that stand up for students' interests? It's frankly despicable that he was even, you know, put forward. It's ridiculous. Okay. Dom <laughs> Dominic Rahm. Well, I certainly agree that the nature of his comments came back to haunt him to such an extent where it became inevitable that he would have to resign. And I agree that those in public office should be held to a higher standard. But I do just want to say this in relation to... Um, there's, there's two sides to this story. This is also a guide uh, put a, a heart and soul into setting up free schools and new, uh, so, to, so kids from disadvantaged backgrounds could have a strong education. But the problem is all the focus comes off that if the story is all about your track record of being an edgy commentator and taking things too far. I just wish Dawn would apply the same standards to the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, who talked and made jokes about lynching the bastard, his words, in relation to Esther McVeigh. And if actually the bar is set here, shouldn't he resign? Yeah. Will, will you condemn that? Dawn, yeah. do you condemn the language John yeah. McDonnell used about yeah. Esther McVeigh? Listen. Just as your colleague, um, uh, Jess Phillips, one of the most formidable Labour um, equalities campaigner, did. Do you agree that it was outrageous? I condemn all abuse against that's, women. I get a lot that's, of abuse. That's the Jeremy Corbyn I get, line. A lot of, I get a lot of abuse <laughs> myself. Well, now, listen. And I would see. stand full square get, with you against that, because it's outrageous. I get a lot of abuse. I get a lot of abuse myself. So I'm against, I'm against abuse against uh, all women and all of the time. But let me tell you something. You keep talking about it. it was, it's historic. Just over 12 months ago, somebody put on Toby Young's desk a sexual health harassment policy. Somebody was brave enough to put it on his desk and underline bits in red, OK? And he responded by hiring a strippergram to go to the workplace on the day of Take Your Daughters Today work. And I, and I, that shows them, right. that shows and what I, he right. 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 Yeah, I just want to... I, I want to get back to the question that you sort of originally posed, uh, sort of in there. I mean, I'm a stand-up comedian, I exercise my free speech regularly, and I've said things that are truly, objectively reprehensible, right? And that's... <laughs> I've said things about members of the panel. I described one member of the panel, I won't tell you who it is, <laughs> as what would happen if someone injected a gammon steak with white privilege. Now... <laughs> again... <laughs> not wishing to give uh, anything away, if I could go back in time, I would high-five myself because it's a funny line, right? <laughs> now, do I consider that an absolute privilege which I util utilise constantly? 
absolutely I do. Do I also realise that that free speech that I've exercised may preclude me from certain jobs? For example, co-hosting Good Morning Britain. <laughs> absolutely. There is consequences to the things that mm. you say. And it's not a... You can't castigate a generation as being oversensitive or this terrible term snowflake that's constantly bandied around without any real context or meaning. You can't castigate a whole generation for taking appropriate measures when you look at someone who's going to be involved in tertiary education. If I wake up tomorrow and suddenly decide that I want to run a university, most of my tweets will probably come back to haunt me. That's not how things work. And also, I just want to quickly add, we're talking a lot about Toby Young and the things that he said. What about the things that he's done? What about the news today that he attended at UCL, a eugenics conference? That is some dark Nazi stuff, man, and is not acceptable wait in minute, modern wait education. Wait, wait OK, wait. let's uh, just... OK, before... Stop. Wait, wait, Piers. Before, before... Before we get trouble from the lawyers... You can't call him a just... Nazi, for God's sake. I didn't Sorry. call Piers. him a Nazi. I described the just practice wait. of eugenics as wait, having its wait, history wait, in ancestral wait. fascism. Right. Let's Sorry, just God. explain two things. He says he attended it, sat at the back and listened because he was writing an article, didn't take part in it, wasn't on the panel. And Macdonald, to you, didn't actually himself say that. He was quoting. He may be wrong to have quoted, no, but, but he, he was made quoting. a joke of it, David. But he didn't Those aren't the same things. He, he didn't himself say it. He did. He repeated it. He said, he some people say to me, um, not just she should be sacked, yes, he but didn't lynched say the bastard. He, to, right. to ripples of laughter. I've now satisfied the lawyers, and I clearly haven't satisfied okay. either of you, but that doesn't matter. Right. You up there with the spectacles. Yeah. So, Labour and the Tories can trade barbs with each other yes. all they want yes. on who said what, and everyone's got as much ammunition as they want, but the hypocrisy of the, hypocrisy of the Labour Party when they come back and say, oh, Jared Amar is just suspended, but Toby Young should be sacked. There's people in Sheffield now who don't have a voice in Parliament because mm. the Labour Party just won't do anything. They need to take action and be consistent in dealing out their outrage equally amongst can, anyone okay. who... Gin, it's Gin been dealt with. Gin Miller. It is can, I, dealt with. Um, can I say that I absolutely agree with I think the, the scoring of political points has got to stop. We have got to find a way of having adult conversations when it comes to really important matters. Because the lessons we're leaving for our children is, you know, you can behave whichever way you want, there's no consequence, you can lie, you can cheat. This is serious. You cannot have somebody in public office that's behaving like this. And I don't know how incompetent the screening process must have been to actually let him get into that position. Because it's going to be a position where you are actually influencing the future generations. And to have someone there thinking it's a joke, or laughing, or thinking it's funny, or, you know, his friends who support him and said, oh, don't be so soft. If this is not just about women. This is about anyone. You have no right to degrade another person. I'm sorry, but you don't. Okay. Uh, You're not yes. So, so Toby Young has said some awful things and has since been removed from government. Uh, Piers's mate, Donald Trump, uh, has said some awful things too and is still the President of the United States. OK, well, I'm not coming to Trump. We might come to Trump later, but we'll just see. The man there in the blue... Yeah, isn't jacket. it to do with Theresa May's judgement, basically? Mm. She was the one who appointed this guy. She, you know, people closest to her would have had... Obviously, stuff on Toby Young looked into his past, you would have hoped, and yet he slips through the net and he's there and she gets another crisis she's dealing with <laughs> now. Because, yeah, she didn't deal with it at the beginning. Dominic so, Rabb, you oh, answer this point? Why did he slip right. through the net? Why did Joe well, Johnson he, let him get through the net? Why did Theresa May say, as long as he doesn't do it again, it'll be OK? Well, look, look, first of all, he was appointed because of the positive things he'd done. But in the end, you may be right, but look, social media going back years, is, it's difficult to screen that. How many man hours do you want the government to put into that? But look, it should have obviously been done uh, better and, and we learned the lesson. But, sorry, just... Social media can I just answer not your... being very good on social media at all anyway. Well, may, may, in maybe. campaigns as well. He has found so my tweet Maybe that's what minutes. it is. Yeah. Well, we should get him involved, but um, I'm, not sure he'd, uh, I'm not sure he'd come and work for the Tories. But the point, the point is this. To describe it as a crisis, I think most people looked at that and thought, you know, people care about real things, the state of the economy, whether you voted leave or remain, no, making the success of Brexit. But you're right to say that we should be held to the higher standard. I just wish Labour would apply some consistency and we wouldn't get the rank double standards we see at the moment. Stop. All right. Point we're, 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 OK. I'm not saying apply the standard consistently. A, 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 brief, a brief word, so I think we must move on to uh, 
uh, something I, else. I said there's a fundamental so, issue yes. here in regards to the process. There's a fundamental issue to how these public appointments are made. Because I would like other people who are interested in higher education to get an opportunity to be part of a, a, a quango and a government body. And the gentleman in the audience yeah, is absolutely right. It does throw into Jean. question the judgment of the Prime Minister and also uh, the power that she has. Because on Sunday she defended him. In Parliament I had to stand up for an hour. Joe Johnson defended him, only for the next day for him then to okay. resign because it's untenable. Yes, yes, you can. You can come in. I'll just bring Nish Kumar. I'll bring, no, bring Nish okay, okay. I, I, I just want to say, just again, just to bring it back to this question, I'm just, I'm so sick. Don't of, say the same thing again. No, no, no I'm, just, say I'm twice. profoundly sick of people like Toby Young, who described himself as a journalistic provocateur, who professionally are essentially unpleasant people. And that's what they do. They do things to get a reaction. And then when they get a reaction, they throw their toys out of the pram. Grow okay. up. <laughs> Gina, briefly, okay. if you would. Um, I, I spoke to somebody very senior in the university circle last night, and it's a small circle, and they said, to Don's point, that they're not aware of anybody who was allowed the opportunity for the, to go to stand up and be interviewed for that post. And it's a very small community. That is extremely worrying and very uh, opaque, and we've got to have more transparency in these appointments. OK, we'll move on to another question now. Uh, Daniela Adeloya, please. Miss targets, failed pledges, patients dying in hospitals. Isn't it high time that Jeremy Hunt is sacked rather than acquiring additional responsibilities? Right, in case you missed it. In case you missed the beginning of it, uh, Daniela, Miss targets, failed pledges, patients dying in hospital, all while Hunt is health secretary. Isn't it time he was sacked instead of acquiring, as he did this week, more responsibility? Dominic Raab? Well, look, th there's definitely challenges in the NHS at the moment. And when you see some of the reporting, of course, my, um, uh, I think that the job of the GPs and the nurse on the front line is heroic. Um, but I also think we need to have some measure of the big picture here. And the Commonwealth Fund in 2017 looked at health services around the world and found from, looked from New Zealand to Norway and found the NHS to be the safest and the best in the world. Now, we've put more money than ever, 12 billion more than in 2010 yeah. when the last government were in charge. We put, promised another 6 billion. We've also got to do things differently, uh, and we've, uh, we've started to do that. We've got more beds, more doctors, more flu vaccines available than ever before. But I do think that it requires um, a long-term view. We need to um, also change the way we're doing things in the NHS. One of the big things in the reshuffle was integrating social care with the NHS. Uh, you and haven't used the word hunt. So far. <laughs> well, I, look, I think anyone doing that job has got a hell of a, a, hell of a, um, a task at hand. But if you look at these problems we're facing in the winter, they're true across the UK, and we've had them for years. They're true in Scotland, where the SNP are in charge of the NHS. They're true in Wales, where Labour are in charge. You have them in France, you have them in Australia. And it's very difficult to, do, to, to deal with these spikes in demand and pressures on the NHS at winter time. All but right. we are better prepared than ever. Don't take that from me. That comes from Professor Keith what? Willits, who is in charge of a and E units up and down the country. Daniela, uh, that's you want not to come back asked, on this? So I'm <laughs> going to reiterate that really simply. We have an incompetent Prime Minister. She remains in office yet lacks power, and thus this enables ministers to bully her to acquire additional ministerial responsibilities. You know, the NHS is a vital service for our nation. It's not a playground for career-hungry politicians. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, very briefly, yeah, can I come back to you? Gina Miller, I'll come back to you. Gina Miller. I mean, this, this idea that it's a winter crisis, it's actually every year it's a winter crisis. It's just diverting attention to the fact that the NHS has been in crisis for eight years. And then you've got people like the, all the, the King Fund, you've got all the, the Nuffield Trust. How many more experts, the BMH here in London, all saying that the, the NHS is underfunded? It needs uh, urgently about four billion a year. It's getting 1.6, and that's set to go down. We, the, you know, Dominic comes up with figures. Actually, listen to the figures that the um, profession itself is saying. You know, we have the lowest spend of any OECD country when it comes to bed per thousand, 2.6. You look at Germany. Look at our staffing levels. It's a disgrace. But the only way the problems of the NHS, in my view, will be will be uh, actually addressed is to have a full audit of the NHS that looks at everything from staffing to procurement to administration and actually ask the people who work in the NHS what is it that they need and have a joined up cross party solution to this. It's too important to leave to one political party. Thank you. Thank you. Piers Morgan. 
Well, Jeremy Hunt is the he's the Arsene Wenger, isn't he, of, of this government? He just won't go, and it doesn't matter how badly he and his team perform, uh, he just won't leave. And in fact, eventually, after five years of this, ending in this absolute nadir of what we've now got on our hands over this winter, the worst ever, he gets called in by his boss. He says, "I'm moving you on," and he says. Oh, no, I'd rather stay, if you don't mind. Oh, righto, you stay then. Carry on. It's a complete and utter farce, isn't it? The NHS problem is not actually... It's not just about the Tories, not just about Labour. They've all cocked it up for decades. And the reason they've cocked it up is they've been unable to respond to the harsh reality of what has happened to this country. The NHS was, was started in 1948, 70 years ago. When it, by uh, Labour. By Labour. It was a brilliant idea. Well, we all agree. We all agree we love the NHS. I've had to use it a few times in the last two years for various injuries. I've fallen over, broken ribs. My wife fell over, broken ribs. We all fall over in my house. Uh, my little daughter was, uh, had a fit one night. We yeah, took her in. Amazing, amazing treatment every time by the brilliant staff of the NHS. But they're overworked, they're underpaid, and they're exhausted. And the, the point I was going to make was the, the population has grown by a third since the start of the NHS, and it's projected to grow to 74 million, another 10 million, by 2039. This population is also living a lot longer. So we have a massively larger number of people living a lot longer, putting a huge new strain on a system that simply wasn't devised to tolerate this number of people using it. Right. We've got to have big thinking, and all this lot have to come together, stop the petty point scoring, get in a room, and work out big solutions to try and save the NHS. All right. Let me, let me, so we don't go round and round on the same point, throw in a question from George Sweet here on the, exactly the same topic. George. Do you support a new tax specifically to fund health care? One idea. Does the panel support a new tax specifically to fund health care, which was put forward uh, today or the other day, and which would mean the national insurance became national insurance? What do you think? Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree with that. The reality is that uh, if we want this incredible service, which isn't just something that provides, uh, you know, free at the point of delivery healthcare, it also is more economically efficient than a huge number of the part of fully privatised healthcare systems that exist around the world. We've got to pay for it. And what we need is a politician who has the guts to look at the British public and say, listen, if you want this incredible service, then you have to pay for it. But that has not been helped since 2010 by a string of cuts to various different levels of taxation and also a string of cuts imposed by this government, not just on the healthcare service, but on social care. And the cuts to social care have increased the pressure on the National Health Service. This is a very simple thing. I'm sick of every time I turn on my television and there's a politician talking about the NHS, they all say the same thing, exactly what you said, Dominic. Mm. Hey, oh, they do incredible work. Oh, we admire them so much, but we're not going to give them any money. It's a a simple solution. We've got to cough up and we need politicians that have the guts to say Why that. don't we ask the audience? Why don't we ask the audience? No, no. Oh, show, yeah. show no, hands. no, we will not have um, peers. We will not okay. have a show of hands. We do not do show... I don't know what you do on your show. We do you're show not, of hands. You're, oh, fine. Go back to your show. You're not chairing this one. Do Dawn Butler. <laughs> Dawn Butler. Dominic, Dominic, I, I Dominic Raab, you, just, just before you start, Dominic on. Raab said, and the Prime no. Minister said it in the House of Commons uh, this week, that uh, it's said that the British National Health Service is the best health service in the entire world. It went through a whole string of countries. Best in the world. Do you agree with that? Yes, yeah, so why don't they pay the doctors and the nurses? No, sorry, do you agree with that, that it is the best? I think it is the best. I think that there's right. other countries right. that are looking to other countries emulate, have worse problems. No, looking mean? to emulate the our NHS. Which Sorry, let me get which, this clear. Which, Do you mean that other countries have worse problems than Britain? <laughs> that we have, we, as far as the National Health Service goes, we have the top quality, cream of the cream. We, we have a great NHS. At the moment, it's starved of resources. It's starved of cash. It's low on doctors. There's thousands of uh, vacancies for nurses. And that is because this government stopped nurses' bursaries. You know, they're doing one thing on one hand and then, they're then they say on the other hand, oh, everything's great. You have to have some joined up thinking. You can't keep compartmentalising things. And this, and this government, it just drives me crazy because you're just out, so out of touch. 
I mean, they're giving the NHS just 1% every year. Under Labour, it was 4% every year. It needs more money, not we're, less we're, money. We're putting 12 billion more per year than under Labour. And if you look at Wales, it. if it you look like at you're Wales... Well, okay, just, I listen to you. I, 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 listen to, I listen to you. In Wales, where Labour is charged, less money Nobody is going in. Nobody believes it. Nobody believes it because they feel it. People use the NHS. People use the NHS. They know what it feels like when you have to wait. Sorry, not the only one. John, I'm just going to come back to this. But you're, you're, you're talking about it as though it was in a state of collapse, and yet you agree that it's the best in the world at the Tory well, claim. You agree no, with them. It's, it's the, the, the NHS, in how it's created, is, in fact, in theory, the best in the world if it had the resources and the money to carry out what it needs to That's do. That's what your answer there to are, There I'm are nurses who are spending their shifts, their entire shifts, in the car park of the hospital because question. ambulances are parked up and can't get in to the hospital. And what do you think, of, do what do you think, of, what do you think of George Sweet's yes. proposal that we should have a special tax for the National Health Service called National Health Insurance? Well, it's a good idea, one you consider? The Labour Party's manifesto as plan was to raise taxes to the top 5% and so that, that can, so we can give the NHS the funding it needs. And that was in the Labour Party's manifesto. Right. And also, if we stop all the corporation tax, 70 billion by 2020, that money could yes. also go into the all NHS. Right, but you haven't answered that question. The woman at the very back there, yes, you. Um, like Pierre says, um, the NHS is far from a Tory problem, though they've certainly not helped it. Um, but instead of um, engaging, admitting there's a problem and engaging in some useful discussion as to what can actually be done to sort it, they just seem to be operating in a system of complete denial and trotting out a survey which it clearly is, doesn't reflect the day-to-day -day experiences that our frontline NHS staff are telling us that they're experiencing. OK. And the woman in red there? I think it's really easy to just think this is a, a problem that... Um, I mean, Theresa May, she's sitting in an office, she's looking at paperwork saying, oh, cuts here, cuts there. But she's not going to be affected by this because the people who are making the decisions can actually afford private health care. They're not going to be affected by not enough hospital beds. People in this country need the NHS to survive. Gina Miller. <laughs> um, I think going back to George and then this question is, it, I, mean, I think there was a Sky report saying I think 68% of people would agree to a tax or 1% increase that if they could guarantee it would go to the NHS. But as Dawn said, I actually think we should be cracking down on all those companies who are not paying tax in this country. And they're the ones like the Googles and the Amazons and that money should be going to the NHS. And okay. on, uh, on the point of uh, the other thing is, uh, one of the suggestions has been a royal commission which I think is a complete waste of time and money and will take too long because actually there are already good reports out there. There's a Barclay report, there's a House of Lords report just last year. Why do you not just use what's already there and get on and make some changes cross-party? OK, and you in the second row there, ma'am. Yeah, um, so I recently had a family member admitted to hospital for several months and night after night there was one nurse to the whole ward. The staff's shortage on the wards is stark. <laughs> what is the government going to do to get more nurses on the ground? Okay. And I go to the, yes, the man on the gangway there, with the moustache. Yes, you, sir. Me? Yep. Yeah, um, I think the government needs to come up with a realistic long-term plan. We're all fed up of these false promises and numbers being plucked out of thin air. For example, in 2015, Jeremy Hunt said they were going to promise 5,000 new GPs by 2020. Actually, last year, we've got 1,000 less GPs than we had the previous year. Where are these doctors going to come from? Is there a magic doctor tree? I don't think so. <laughs> OK. I'm going to... We've got, only, we've, got, we've, got only, we've got only a few minutes left, and I want to get in a couple of other questions, if I can, because we'll come back to the NHS frequently. I'd like to take this question from Michael Harpen, please. Do you agree with Donald Trump that he is a very stable genius? <laughs> uh, Nish Kumar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, for the purposes of my possible visit to America later <laughs> on in the year, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> Donald, I want you to know. <laughs> I think you might be the greatest genius of all time. Uh, b b between us, the guy is an absolute lunatic. I mean, 
uh, as much as I uh, respect Oprah Winfrey and admire the speech uh, she gave last weekend, uh, it does say something of the extent to which Donald Trump has debased the American presidency as an institution, mm. that one speech at an award ceremony has people being like, she should be president. <laughs> Piers Morgan? Um, well... <laughs> Thank you for letting me speak, David. Um, I think speaking as an unstable... As long as you don't speak too long. <laughs> <laughs> speaking as a, an unstable genius myself, um, no, Trump is an interesting character. He, if you like him, you love him. If you hate him, you detest him. I've travelled a lot in America recently. LA, New York, they can't stand him. A bit like Britain, uh, many parts of Britain. But actually, if you go through the middle of America, the flyover states, I've been in Missouri, Texas, Florida, they love Donald Trump. They love the fact he's a maverick. They love the mad tweeting. They love him standing up to Kim Jong-un. They love the fact the economy is actually beginning to surge in America. The job numbers are good. That He's taking on ISIS. You can construct a very positive story about Trump, which is clouded by all the tweeting, or you can just continue to say the guy is a lunatic and we should ban him from ever coming to Britain, for example. He's due here in February. I hope we afford him, not because he's Donald Trump, but because he's a president of the United States, I hope we afford that office and that country, which is going to be vital to us post-Brexit, the kind of respect that America and the offices of the presidency deserves. So in that sense, I'm very happy, if you're watching, Mr. Trump, to call you a stable genius. Okay. All right, then, you, sir, over there. Yeah, briefly, yeah. if you would. From our wonderful liberal position here in London, uh, it's very easy to treat Mr. Trump as an easy target. Uh, don't forget that the Americans actually voted for him. OK. And up, up there, the man... Yes, you, sir. Yep. What's going to happen in 2020 when it's the next US election? We've got Oprah Winfrey, we've got Donald Trump already. <laughs> next, I oh, hear The Rock's going to get involved. I mean, Piers, do you want to do the UK election next well, month? Well, funny enough, uh, there was a poll on ITV this week and 57% of the British public thought I should replace Theresa May. So, uh, wow. the campaign starts tonight. <laughs> now I want to see a show of hands. Yeah. Gina, Gina Miller. No show of hands allowed. <laughs> now I want to see a show Gina of Miller. hands. I, I think uh, Trump is no denying he's a narcissist. Um, I don't know about a, a genius. I mean, someone who actually has to put that down on a tweet, you have to question. But I think uh, I do agree with Piers that you have to respect the office. And, you know, there's no saying you get the politicians you deserve. Perhaps there's something about what's happened in American politics and how little the public in America have trusted the establishments in the US that have led to a Trump being in power. And perhaps it will lead to the shock that the American people need to get a better leader next time. OK, Dominic Rao. You probably have to be polite, do you? Look, I, I watched that soap opera in Washington, D.C., and be as bemused as everyone else, but the Americans voted for him, and where, the way I look at it is the ties that bind our countries and our peoples, American, British, are far deeper and far more important than any individual politician on this side or that side of the Atlantic, and whether it's on trade, on co security cooperation, on the fight against Daesh. Actually, what well, I tend to focus relentlessly on that, and I think Theresa May has done the right thing of saying, do you know what, I'll tell him when I disagree, but we're gr engaging grown-up diplomacy, not student union politics. That means we get close to him, we exert positive influence. We tell him when we think he's got it wrong on Putin, on NATO, on the tweeting around Britain first, which was um, abhorrent. But actually, what matters most is the bonds uh, the, and, the, and the ties that we have between our two peoples. And they are stronger than any politicians. Can I, can I just and say... You, yeah, uh, yes. I just I want to say to that there. how you how you there's a couple of things people keep saying the American people voted for him. Firstly, the majority of America did not vote for him because <laughs> he lost the popular vote. <laughs> Secondly, uh, I, I can't help but feel how you relate to Donald Trump does have a it's, there's a huge relationship with what your ethnicity is. And I suspect that if you're a white American, you might think, well, let's see how this maverick plays out. But if you're not white, it might be a very, very different story. Because maverick, certainly in the last couple of years, seems to be code for enormous racist. The man in white at the back there. <laughs> you, sir. I'll, um, I'll go one further and say he's more than a narcissist. He's probably a sociopath. But then... Um... Aren't most people who've got to the top of the polit political right, and corporate you're... ladder? <laughs> and um, at the end of the day, the American um, political system has enough people around him who I believe are sensible and the, the correct mechanics to get rid of him should they need to. Okay. Don Butler. Um, I think that uh, Theresa May showed a serious lack of judgment in uh, inviting him after seven days to come to our country on a state visit. And I don't think uh, that should be allowed or happen. Is he a very, um, is he a very stable genius? 
I think he said he's a very, very stable genius, didn't he? I think he had two berries in there. Well, I think he's got his medical on Friday. Uh, <laughs> let's wait and see. OK. <laughs> right. Now, we've got a couple of minutes left, and we've got one... This sounds this program's designed for you, Piers, because you claim to be a friend of Donald Trump. But I'm going to take this question just round the panel. Um, Molly Farias, I think it is. Is that the pronunciation? Anyway, Molly. Is the decision by Virgin Trains to stop selling the Daily Mail a form of censorship? The decision, Virgin Trains say that they're not selling the Daily Mail because it's not, doesn't fit the ethos of Virgin Trains, whatever that may be, and therefore they're not going to sell it. Um, OK, Dawn Butler, you start on it. Um, I mean, it's, I'm in favour of free speech. I mean, occasionally, I've never bought the Daily Mail, can I just say? Never read it? I, but... I have read it because sometimes I want to see what they're saying. I think it's important sometimes well, to see people what normally buy people newspapers. Who, no, but to see what people who I don't dis who I disagree with are saying immensely. So sometimes I think that's important. But it's up to Virgin. Okay, is it a form of censorship? What do you think? Do you know? Um, the Daily Mail and I have not been friends, um, <laughs> but uh, I think at the end of the day, they've look. They've got falling numbers. You know, newspapers are not going to be as important in the future. It's more they're going to be available online. People on the Virgin train can connect online and read it online. So that it's a it's a hollow gesture to say you can't actually buy it. They can just go online and read. No, it. but the line that's important is we've no, decided no, no, this line, paper is not compatible well, the actually, with the they, Virgin brand well, Virgin, and our beliefs. Virgin made a mess of communicating that because first of all they said it was based on consumer research, and then it came out that they said it actually didn't fit with our brand, um, which was a confusing way of putting out that message. But I think if they had made that decision that they don't want it on their trains, then people can buy it elsewhere. I mean, they're a corporate right. entity. They are allowed to make that decision if they want. Piers Morgan, is it censorship? Uh, of course it's censorship, and it's pathetic, frankly. I expect more from Sir Richard Branson, a guy I've always admired. Uh, the truth is, they're only going to stop now the Times, a Guardian and a Mirror, which all back remain. Sounds good. Uh, well, there's two points I'll make about the Mail, which is one of the most successful newspapers in the world. Right? I write for it, so I would say that, but it happens to be true. And the mail is not everyone's cup of tea, but those who like it and buy it really enjoy it on a daily basis. The Daily Mail has been at the forefront this week of a stunningly successful campaign on plastic bags. It's forced the government into making really dramatic moves now on the environment and plastic bags. That was a Daily Mail-led campaign, right? Okay, so but, when, uh, sorry, so when, it's just about censorship. Well, here's the point. When Virgin say they don't share those values, does that mean that Virgin doesn't share that value? Does it mean oh, that actually... God. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, but it needs, Well, it needs to be said. All right. And I think it is censorship. I think it's wrong of them to do it. They're just doing it for cheap publicity and shame but on... But nobody was Dominic, buying it. Dominic Rubb, we're, we're out nobody of time. Do, Dominic Rubb. I'm not sure it's censorship because they've the, got the right to choose who, who they sell, but I, I do think it's a bit of a hollow gesture, like Gina said. And the real thing is that they're turning their nose up at all those millions of people that read the Daily Mail and saying... In, in effect, you know, you're not our kind of people. Right. I think in these kind of situations, the consumer is king. Let people decide what they read. Nish? Yeah, I, I mean, I like to read Empire magazine on the train, but it's not available. So what I do is I go to uh, these places called the news agents. <laughs> they have them quite readily around the country, uh, in the train station often, and I buy it, and then I read it on the train because I'm an adult, and I don't stand there screaming about my free speech being violated. And the only thing I would say... The only thing I would say... <laughs> ..is that... But, uh, clearly, the, uh, this is absolutely a publicity stunt from Virgin. And Virgin are a company that, in the last sort of couple of weeks, have not covered themselves in glory in terms of their corporate ethics. Now, if I was the Daily Mail, and I'm the first to admit that I'm not, but if I was the Daily Mail, I might look at that and think, wow, how bad was, must we be if even Virgin are judging us? OK. <laughs> right, we're out of time, I'm afraid. I'm sorry for those who have your hands up. Um,